Here's another installment of our discussion on neurotransmitters, neurohormones, and neuropharmacology. So what you're seeing here are just some areas of act that are being activated in the brain. Here we're looking at the cerebellum down here, we're looking at the hippocampus, substantia nigra, which we're going to talk a little bit about, and the globus, glo globus pallidus, which uh, we will discuss. But first, remember that neurotransmitters are any chemical that are in the brain that are involved with activating neurons. Um, and there's a whole complex system. There's a lot of them that have been identified. Some of the ones that you're researching now are the major ones. When we look at neurochemistry, we're just looking at sort of the chemical piece of it. So it's like when you look at a chemical formula or you look for, um, that's what we're doing with neurochemistry is to see how these are constructed from the chemical standpoint. The neuropharmacology is looking really at how these compounds or other compounds can, can have an effect on the nervous system. We talked already about this, this idea that our bodies make a lot of these chemicals naturally, and those are endogenous. So things which are endogenous chemicals are any chemical the body makes that, um, that would be naturally occurring. Um, if it's something that is activating a receptor, we call those endogenous ligands. Right, so this is, these are ones that typically we're talking about when we're looking at the brain. We can also talk about exogenous um, materials or chemicals, which are things that we can take in from outside. So the drugs, whether recreational or, or therapeutic types of drugs um, that have an effect on the nervous system. There are a lot of uh, sort of a criteria for what are these things we call neurotransmitters, but this is kind of a general list for most of them, not for all of them. And mostly I just want you to have an understanding of sort of the basics here, that when we start talking about them, we're looking at things which have been made generally in the presynaptic axon terminal, um, but sometimes it can be made somewhere else. But in general, they're found there, and, and, and they're very, sorry, they aren't necessarily made there, but they're found there. Um, and then they're found in these presynaptic cells. Sometimes they're actually manufactured in the cell body and then transported down the axon to the terminal, and others are made right in the terminal. Um, when an action potential reaches the end of the line and calcium comes in, this is where they, when they get released, you know that, that routine. Um, and then somewhere on the other side, there has to be some kind of a receptor that's going to accept it. And when you... When that happens, when they accept it, then you're going to get changes in that postsynaptic cell. And those changes can be excitatory or inhibitory or even modulatory, meaning somewhere not uh, just kind of altering a little bit. In general, we use this, this way of looking at the neurotransmitters to see if they actually are a neurotransmitter, and that's by experimentally blocking them to see if you block it, what happens. So that's just a way of testing. Now, we're talking about a lot of these, right? We're looking at things called amine neurotransmitters, which are uh, an amine is something that has a lot of, of nit um, sorry, nitrogen in it. Um, the structure of amines you may remember, like amino acids. Um, and we'll look at their structure. Some of you have already presented some of this. Then we also have the amino acid neurotransmitters, which are the much simpler of, or simplest of all, almost, um, and that's GABA and glutamate. So really important ones, the most prominent ones in the nervous system. We have peptides, and remember what peptides are, just short chains of proteins. And peptide neurotransmitters, um, I don't know why it says or neurotransmitters, it could be neuromodulators here. Um, would, uh, we'll look at some of those in particular, and the last one, the gas neurotransmitters are ones that I will talk about specifically coming up. So there's a list here of different types and how we can classify them. And you can see the amines and some of the ones that fit under that. There's the amino acids, there's the neuropeptides. We've heard a little bit on um, the enkephalins. Um, we're going to hear something on endorphins. We've heard a little on oxytocin. So, so we've had a sampling of some of these GABA, um, glutamate. We're going to look at 
um, more of them. The other thing, though, that we've mentioned is that there are other chemicals in the body that also can have an effect on the nervous system, and hormones are some of those chemicals. So when they do, when hormones themselves um, are going to have an effect on either by being released by neurons into the bloodstream or, um, or in some other fashion, these things are um, considered neurotransmitters in the sense of their, their, their origin as a neuron, they're going into the bloodstream, but their way in which they act will be different. Um, and we're going to see some of those. So there's a little grocery list here, and some of you have a couple of these on your, um, um, on your, in your presentation. So we'll, we'll see some of these, these things which can sometimes be neurotransmitters when we're only looking at their, how they're communicating within the brain and strictly within the nervous system. But once they're released into the bloodstream and can move and can activate a receptor that's outside of the nervous system or the central nervous system, it very often is considered a hormone. So we're going to see some more on that. Hormones are different than neurons in that they're just slower. And because they're slower and because they can go to many, many more places, they can have much more long-term effects, so they're very, uh, they're slow to act and, and they're also slow to shut off. Where neurons, when they communicate, it's much more precise. One neuron is talking specifically to another neuron or set of neurons. Um, and in general, neuronal communication is much quicker off and on. Here's a picture that kind of shows you that. So when you have a neuron and it's releasing something that goes onto directly onto another neuron, we know what that is. So that's your basic neurotransmission. But when we have a neuron that's going to release something that's going to go into the bloodstream, then what we're going to see is it's this idea of neuroendocrine activity. So the, the, the material, the neurohormone is going into the bloodstream and, the, and it's getting carried all over the place and it's going to only act on cells which have receptors on them for that particular um, neurotransmitter, neurohormone. I should say neurohormone there. So messages which are fast are neural. Slower ones are going to be hormonal. And neuromodulators are sort of these guys that are hanging out and influencing all of this. So they can have all sorts of different effects depending on what they are. So they can influence the activity of a synaptic transmitters, whether or not something even gets released. Um, it can be under the influence of a neuromodulator. Um, we're going to also see that other things can apply, such as how far away something is from the target, from what's released that hormone and to where it goes. So we'll, we'll mention that a little bit, but not too much. So just something to keep in mind. Neurohormones can also, just like neurotransmitters, they can be proteins or peptides. They can be amines. Um, again, so you can see neurotransmitters here. These are acting as neurohormones because they go into the, the bloodstream. They can be steroids, meaning that they have um, kind of a lipid base, so they can go right into cells. They don't even need a lot of these steroid hormones, don't need receptors in some cases. So we'll, we'll look at a little bit on that. Okay, so receptors are the topic really here because what we want to do is understand that this, while a neurotransmitter is kind of like the daily newspaper, it's kind of cheap to produce, cheap to be, you know, let out, easily used, gets recycled really fast. But the receptors are really the Cadillacs of the system in that you've got to have the receptors in order that you can do anything with the neurotransmitters. So there's a couple of classes of receptors. One we've mentioned, and we've used mostly this one right here, this ionotropic receptor, one that is generally, we looked at these on these ligand gated channels, where basically they open a channel, let an ion in, close the channel. So it's a, it's a quick activity. And here you can see it kind of here, where it's when something is not yet bound, it, it's not open, the pore is closed, but as soon as there's a, a binding that takes place from a neurotransmitter in, 
then what you get is an opening of that channel, and then in comes sodium in this case. There's also the slower ones, though, and these are the ones that are more refined in a sense because these are ones that we can, that have multiple things that can happen once they get in to a cell, but they don't come in through a metabotropic receptor. They activate the receptor, and then once that has landed on its receptors, this would be a neurotransmitter, this green blob here, it's going to set up a whole cascade of things happening within the cell. So this is inside the cell, in the cell body, which will activate a whole series of other things. One of those can be, let's go over here and open this ion channel and let ions come in. But it's, a, it's sort of an indirect way of doing it. Um, the other thing it can do is activate a lot of the genes, so it can create stuff on this side. And I'll give you some specific examples of this. And that's uh, these metabotropic receptors are called, are very often linked to this thing called a G protein. You might remember G protein coupled receptors. So a variety of things can happen, slower activity, and generally larger effect. Now here's the two just to see them again. So release on the presynaptic side, neurotransmitter comes over, lands on a receptor, opens the channel, in goes the ion. Metabotropic though, here we have the receptors, there's a metabotropic receptor, lands on it, and then causes, but the ions aren't coming in. So what you get then is a series of things that are activated inside here. And some of that activation can include opening other ion channels. We use these terms already, so you know what a ligand is. Uh, you do want to know what the difference is between an agonist and an antagonist. So if a, an agonist is anything, any neurotransmitter, that it basically goes across, activates a receptor normally. But there also can be things which are antagonists, and those things can go over and, and activate a receptor, but in effect really are blocking it from other things happening. So that's an antagonist. And then this, this third option, this inverse agonist, just basically is, okay, somebody goes over, lands on the receptor, but it's an agonist, but it's going to cause the reverse or the opposite of what the normal function is. Now, I don't really care that you know the inverse agonist one, but I do want to know agonist and antagonist. So those you want to pay attention to. All right. When something comes in, let's, so now we're going to look at neuromodulators in terms of receptors. So if something comes to a receptor and it's going to bind to some site on that receptor that's not the normal part of the receptor, but something that's a kind of like off on the side. Um, what that is is something called a non-competitive uh, ligand. And those are the ones that are frequently these things we call neuromodulators. So they're going to land on a receptor, and they're going to cause something to happen that's different. They're going to modulate it. Maybe it won't open quite as much. Maybe it'll open larger. Um, and we're going to see some examples of that as well. I have just a couple minutes, and then I'll quit this. Um, actually, I might quit right here because I know I don't want to steal anyone's thunder. We're going to talk about this neurotransmitter acetylcholine, and, the, and it's, it was the first one discovered. I think I've mentioned the guy who, who dreamt about it, the, the frog guy, uh, Otto Loewe. Um, but we will talk about this more um, as we get going on to more of our presentations. So. Awesome. Thanks.